And it's that feeling of strangeness when the familiar becomes suddenly unfamiliar and nothing is quite as it seems. Is at the heart of ghost stories, tales of haunted houses, human-like replicants and disquieting doubles. It fascinated Freud and its unsettling power is felt across the arts. The author Hugh Horton presents The Uncanny. The uncanny is an uneasy relationship between what you expect in the world and something that's unexpected, that doesn't seem quite right. And it becomes rather frightening. It's a very specific kind of fear that has to do with strangeness, something that feels both recognisable but alien. The point at which the mundane inverts itself and all your expectations are completely thrown. It's a kind of um, disconnect, a dissonance. On a scale of terror, it's not about shock moments, but if you're trying to create a creeping atmosphere of unease, then that's what it's all about. When Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, wrote about the experience he called the uncanny, he described it as belonging to the realm of the frightening, of what evokes fear and dread. Something that should have remained hidden and has come into the open. A kind of fear and a kind of puzzle. Writing just after the end of the First World War, Freud brought the strangeness of the uncanny itself into the open giving it a new currency that reached far beyond his own field of psychoanalysis. The word itself, like the experience on which it draws, goes back much further. Still a fairly recent term in Freud's day, the Oxford Dictionary defines the uncanny as partaking of a supernatural character, mysterious, weird, uncomfortably strange or unfamiliar, common from around 1850. But the uncanny represents a peculiarly modern sense of being haunted, and it continues to be felt within fiction and storytelling, an unsettling resource for art, film and music. For all its manifestations in these many media, the uncanny remains at heart a very strange and unsettling idea. For like charity, the uncanny begins at home. Novelist A.S. Byatt the word itself is puzzling. The word itself is, you could say, slippery. It keeps changing its meaning. I have a vision in my mind of a kind of semi-transparent building, which is a home in which a person is at home, and yet it doesn't hold its shape properly. The rooms are not what you thought they were going to be when you come into them. And we've all had that. We've all come in the front door and felt that the house wasn't right. Wrong. Wrongness is the key to it. In simple terms, it's seeing something that feels and looks familiar and then there's something wrong about it. Writer and actor Mark Gatiss. I think it is a quality that all kinds of things can possess. It is, however, connected to the notion of the home. It doesn't have to take place in the house for it to be frightening. But if you see something which immediately invokes a familiar and rather comforting sensation, which is then immediately flipped upside down, that's what it is. It's the notion of domesticity, I think, that the domestic rendered horrific is what the uncanny is to me. We, of course, say safe as houses. But in the summer, I live alone in a little French house for some of the year, and I sit there and write books, and I love being alone. But some nights when I come in, I dare not go anywhere near the steps to the loft because I can feel there's something in the loft. There never has been. As far as I know, there never will be, or only my grandchildren. But nevertheless, I stand at the bottom of the loft stairs and think I should make myself go up there, and I don't. The German word for uncanny is unheimliche, which can be literally translated as unhomely, but is intimately connected to, and sometimes overlapping with, the home, the heimlich. This theme of the home being strangely unhomely, out of sorts, not quite right, lies at the heart of the uncanny. The word uncanny 
in English has a relationship to the word unheimlich, which can be translated as uncanny in German. Anthony Wiedler is an architect and writer. Unheimlich in German, which brings the word un and heimlich, which in literal translation is homely, is much more directly related to the house. The notion that something which should be, to all intents and purposes, the most cozy, homely and secure environment at certain moments when the familiar is suddenly defamiliarized and becomes unfamiliar, strangely unfamiliar, can become the, in a sense, the icon of the most unhomely sensations. The uncanny became a preoccupation for Sigmund Freud in psychoanalysis after the First World War. Its roots, though, go back at least as far as the early 19th century, specifically in fiction and the nighttime terrors of the Gothic. Freud's prime example is The Sandman, a story by the great German tale-teller E.T.A. Hoffmann. But we might also think of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein of the same time, Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher, and later Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This was the era that invented the ghost story, science fiction, and fantastic tales, and gave us first-hand chronicles of a parallel world of phantoms, haunted houses, doppelgangers, and doubles, the lifelike doll, the madwoman in the attic. It's as if the house of fiction generated a ghostly opposite from the darkest recesses of its gothic closet. Since the end of the 18th century, architecture has been the scene for uncanny events, uncanny stories. The House of Usher, that tale by Edgar Allan Poe, where he describes the house its facade was dark and impenetrable, bleak walls and vacant eye-like windows. Its very aspect seemed tomb-like, as a space which was impregnated with the fall of the family and therefore haunted. What do you think of the literary roots of the uncanny? Where, where does it come from? When does it start appearing? one of the sources for the uncanny is something to do with gothic horror and something to do, for example, with the haunted house. Now, there's an obvious sense in which the haunted house is a figure or a picture of the haunted mind. Psychotherapist and essayist Adam Phillips. That there being parts of a house or a mind that one is unaware of, only half aware of. So it's as though something is being suggested to us or communicated to us, as though it's a message, even if we don't quite know what it is, but we know we're disturbed by it. The choice of the house, is it because that's where we live, that's where we grow up, that it is, in some sense, the most familiar place? I think it must be that, and that the familiar is disturbingly unfamiliar in many many ways lots of things are taken for granted as the familiar which once they're thought about or experienced in a certain way feel actually very very alien and odd so i think it's partly to do with a sense of a container like a house or a mind that has in it disturbing ghostly hidden presences and it seems to be the case that in 19th century literature there are quite a lot of them Mark Gatiss. One of the most famous stories on this theme, one of my personal favourites, is Hoffman's The Sandman. On such evenings, our mother became very gloomy, and the clock had hardly struck nine before she said, Now, children, to bed, to bed. The Sandman is coming. On these occasions, I really did hear something come clumping up the stairs with slow, heavy tread and I knew it must be the Sandman. Once these muffled footsteps seemed to me especially frightening, and I asked my mother as she led us out, Mama, who is this Sandman who always drives us away from Papa? What does he look like? There is no Sandman, my dear child, my mother replied. When I say the Sandman is coming, all that means is you are sleepy and cannot keep your eyes open, as though someone had sprinkled sand into them. My mother's answer did not content me, and in my childish mind there unfolded the idea that she had denied the Sandman's existence only so that we should not be afraid of him, for I continued to hear him coming up the stairs. I mean, I recognise in that 
so much of what has informed my writing and work and interests for the whole of my life. I mean, there's heavy footsteps up the stairs. I've done that so many times. I'm doing it today. It's something else. It's a recurring theme and image. The idea of being scared and then mollified by a parent or authority figure who tells you everything's all right, knowing that it's not. Funnily enough, that wonderful old 50s song, Mr. Sandman, it's so creepy. It's so creepy, that song. It's such an upbeat song. And again, there's a fantastic disconnect, dissonance there between the jaunty nature of it and what it seems to be suggesting. Uncanny fiction is full of dolls and doppelgangers, lifelike automatons and nocturnal mirror images. Things that look or seem like us, but aren't quite. It's certainly true that we are made very uncomfortable by life-size imitation human beings. Novelist A.S. Byatt. Ernst Jensch wrote an essay which was published in 1906 on the psychology of the uncanny, which is cited by Freud in his essay on the psychology of the uncanny. And Jensch is extraordinarily subtle about why we're so afraid of automata and images of human beings created in the form of human beings. He says, for instance, this peculiar effect makes its appearance when imitations of the human form not only reach one's perception, but when on top of everything they appear to be united with certain bodily or mental functions. The life-size machines that perform complicated tasks, blow trumpets, dance and so forth, very easily give one a feeling of unease. Dolls or dummies figure throughout the modern visual arts, recently here in Britain, in the uncanny installations of the Chapman brothers. Dinos Chapman. The exhibition Jake and I made in summer of 2011, where we separated for a year and made work entirely on our own, I made a group of school children visiting in the local gallery. And they all had identical school uniforms. And they were arranged at the back of the gallery, so they were kind of the last thing you looked at. From the back, they just looked like normal children, only they were standing kind of still, which took a while to work out. There was something wrong with the fact that the children were standing so still and they were so quiet. So that's kind of the first indication that something's a bit wrong. And then as you draw level with them, you see their profiles and you realize that they have snarling snouts and beaks and muzzles bursting out of their faces. But I think the interesting part of that is the realization that they're not real children. Once you got past that point, you understand the gag. But until you realize that they're not just ordinary children, I mean, people I've spoken to have said that that was the thing they found the most frightening. I think Freud is always trying to be precise about fear. He's always trying to, in a sense, unpack the word and the experience so that it's differentiated, because clearly it isn't one thing. Psychotherapist Adam Phillips. And I think one of the things Freud is trying to do is to describe a very specific kind of fear that has to do with strangeness, that has to do with something that feels both recognisable but alien. It's a paradoxical kind of fear, I think. So it both draws you in and somehow distances you. Freud wrote his great essay on the uncanny, bringing the term out of its 19th century closet into the light of the 20th century day. As a commentary on strangeness, it's one of the strangest things he ever wrote. A mixture of literary criticism, psychological study, dictionary definitions and personal memoir. It also relays anecdotes about Freud's own experience of the uncanny, like the time he mistook his own reflection for a demonic old man in a railway carriage. The intruder was my own image, reflected on the mirror on the connecting door, he wrote. Most of all, though, it's a detective story, seeking to crack the reason we find the uncanny so unsettling and the key to its power over our psyche. The literature of the Gothic draws on fear 
and, and horror? I think is it's this on, about horror and terror? I think it's it on a threshold because I think that what Freud is interested in is there's a kind of terror that is so paralyzing that one is unable to think. And I think the uncanny is, if you like, the moment before one is paralyzed by terror. So one has the experience and is struck by it. The uncanny is just the right amount of terror to keep you engaged. Do you think in talking about this notion of the strange actually it depends upon a deep notion of ordinariness, normality, yeah. which it invades. Yes. I mean, what's strange about the idea of the uncanny is that it suggests that we live as if most things are not uncanny. In other words, that there's a largely expected environment of normality, which every so often is ruptured or violated, and then we're struck. And you might say it's at that moment that the uncanny is something that, in the real sense, stimulates us. It almost as though it wakes us up to something. It makes us think. It's potentially very provocative of one's imagination. Freud wrote his essay in 1919, and the shadow of post-war Vienna falls across its pages. He talks of the isolation of the Great War when he came across a scary story in a number of Strand magazine, and of placards in our big cities which advertise lectures that are meant to instruct us in how to make contact with the souls of the departed. We can begin to read this essay as Freud trying to understand this terrifying tragedy constituted by the First World War. Architect and writer Anthony Wiedler. For Freud, this notion of house and its potential for becoming unhomely is, if you like, a microcosm of what he felt the world was in modern times. That the notion that everyone had had of a secure homeland through the 19th century with the building of borders, the establishing of nations, suddenly the First World War had thrown into doubt through the invasions and the counter-invasions, the notion of a secure homeland. So the unhomely house becomes an unhomely land. Perhaps there is something decidedly post-war about the uncanny, less to do with the gore or horror of the trenches than feelings of dissociation and strangeness in war's aftermath, as if there was also something uncanny about the post-war era. A few years earlier, Kafka had published Metamorphosis, a story about a dutiful citizen who turns into a beetle in his parents' house. In 1922, T.S. Eliot published The Wasteland, an uncanny echo chamber in which the poet shows us fear in a handful of dust, as modern London becomes a vast place of haunting where we hear voices singing out of exhausted wells. Over the years, the Freudian uncanny has continued to haunt artists and filmmakers, composers and writers, as well as novelists such as A.S. Byatt and John Banville. Well, I think that all art is a process of making the world uncanny. I mean, in Freud's classic sense, the uncanny, the unheimlich, is the familiar brought back to us in unfamiliar terms. This is what good art does, so that we see it anew. In one of your novels, the protagonist returns to the, his family house and finds what you call a world tilted slightly out of true. How, as a novelist, do you generate a sense of the uncanny? We're constantly representing what was familiar. We're representing it to ourselves in an unfamiliar mode. And I think this is what art in general does. It represents the world to us in ways that are slightly tilted. You know, fiction is a very strange medium. A novel looks like life, it sounds like life, it tastes like life. If it's very good, you know, it seems to be life itself. But in fact, it is nothing like life at all. And this is literally the uncanny in the Freudian sense of the familiar represented to us in unfamiliar mode. I've been making kind of inside-out work for probably around 25 years now. So it's already been a very kind of long process and a long investigation into the sort of inside-out world. Artist Rachel Whiteread's cast of a Victorian terrace house involved filling the building with liquid concrete and stripping the mould. 
that is the exterior of the house itself, bricks and mortar, doors and windows. What was left was a solid structure, the building turned inside out. Fireplaces bulged outwards from the walls, doorknobs became rounded hollows, with windows completely blind and doors you couldn't enter. You know, eventually what you were left with was this building which people had a very strange relationship with because essentially everything that was familiar to them, fireplaces, windows, doorknobs, locks, stairs, everything was inside out. It was something that was so familiar, a building, a house, a Victorian house, but it was so completely different and it made people very uncomfortable and insecure, actually. Do you have an idea why it should be just so disturbing? The idea that where we live, our dwelling places, should become alien or strange or unrecognisable or really different? Well, I think you've, you've said exactly it, that it's something that's so familiar, but it becomes kind of unrecognisable, but only slightly. I think that's where the uncomfortableness lies, is that people are incredibly familiar with it and they're scratching their heads and thinking, I kind of know what that is, but it's not quite as I expected it. Where are the curtains? You know, where's the door? Where's the nice colours? And it's just become a kind of shadow of itself. And I think that's really where the uncanny, unheimlich element sort of lies, is that it's sort of extraordinarily strange, but actually it's not really that different. It's just made people feel uncomfortable. Adam Phillips. We've wanted to think of the arts as usefully disturbing. And I think a lot of people have wanted an art that is not merely reassuring. So that I think the uncanny becomes a figure for, or a picture of what art should be like. It should disturb us and intrigue us. It does seem to me to be the word and an idea most suited to redescription in other media. There's a sense in which the strangeness is being described can be dramatised because they're very dramatic. They can be dreamed and therefore they can be filmed. They can be written about. So it seems to me it's a multimedia. I mean, I suppose one question would be, what's the uncanny in music? Music has been intertwined with the uncanny from the start. The author of The Sandman, E.T.A. Hoffman, was a composer and music critic whose stories are full of music and inspired an opera, Offenbach's Tales of Hoffman featuring the lifelike automaton Olympia. But what about the musical uncanny itself? Tariq O'Regan is a composer and has written for stage and film. One of the ways music can play with the uncanny is by the nature of expectation. Uh, when you start a piece of music, we begin humming along sometimes, even if we've never heard it before, because it's leading us in a certain direction. If you suddenly go against that, in terms of a new melodic idea or a completely different form of accompaniment, we're suddenly in two places at the same time. It's a sense that home can exist at the same time as a completely alien place. And this idea is taken up in many places, including film score writing. One really great example is The Night of the Hunter, which stars Robert Mitchum and involves two young children. At a crucial point in the plot, when they suddenly realise that they're in grave danger of their life, they leave home on an overnight journey on a boat down a river. The young girl sings a lullaby, and this is a piece of music that Walter Schumann wrote specifically for the film. Once upon a time there was a pretty fly. He had a pretty It's very linear, it's very clean, it's very simple. Accompanying that in the score is this dense string writing. And the effect is incredibly unsettling. Not just the accompaniment, but the combination of the two. But one night these two pretty children. And this sense of foreboding and immense danger is created purely in the soundtrack. It's one of the most unsettling things and that for me is one of the great uncanny moments in film score writing In E.T.A. Hoffman's story The Sandman, the automaton Olympia is so real the hero Nathaniel falls in love with her 
This disquieting effect of the human-like but not human persists to the present day, still provoking a version of what the psychiatrist Otto Jentsch called a doubt as to whether an apparently animate object really is alive, and conversely, whether a lifeless object might not perhaps be animate. This is at the heart of many science fiction films where robots, androids or aliens impersonate us humans. The words, gesture, the tone of voice, everything else is the same, but not the feeling. Memories are not, he isn't my Uncle Ira. Well, I'm on your side. It's also the basis for what in contemporary robotics is called, in a great phrase, the uncanny valley. Dr. David Hansen founded Hansen Robotics. The uncanny valley is a term coined by a Japanese robot designer named Masahiro Mori. And it refers to this drop-off that as you get closer to a real human-like depiction, so, you know, a robot that looks very, very human-like, it starts to become unappealing and scary. In the idea of the uncanny valley, the valley refers to this region of uncanniness, not so human-like that it fools you into thinking that it's human and therefore accepting it, and it's not so cartoon-like that it's cute and therefore you accept it. It's in this region where it's like um, this sort of in-between state that causes a, a deep discomfort, a disquiet. It's challenging the human identity. I really do love you all. We love you too, Jules. From the playful fantasias of Doctor Who to the terrifying psychodramas of Ridley Scott's Alien and Prometheus, science fiction trades endlessly on the uncanny boundary between human and alien, person and machine. Its astonishing currency makes me wonder to what extent the modern uncanny is a response to our increasingly digital age of computer-generated images, modelled on images of the uncanny past. Freud brought the uncanny into the light of modern day, and it's now taken up residence in all the arts. Under its enigmatic sign, writers, artists, musicians and filmmakers continue to make it their business to bring into the open what could have, or maybe even should have, remained hidden continuing to provide reports from the home front that remind us of the eerie sense in which we are never fully quite at home. They remind us of the truth of the American poet Emily Dickinson's uncanny words. 